First television screens, then computer screens, now tablet and smartphone screens. Screens have inundated and changed our lives for a full decade now. The internet, social networks, games and videos devour one third of our waking hours. The typical preschool child spends between four and six hours a day in front of a screen of some kind. In nearly every country, children are spending far more time with screens than the recommended allowance. There is a proliferation of alarming studies. We're finding dramatic changes in the brain and in the behavior of these maze. So we should be concerned about this. Our neurons might be in danger. People ask me, why don't you have a Facebook account? Because I know what it does to your brain. Teenagers get addicted. Is today's screen generation really an unhealthy generation? There's a lot of questions out there. Are screens OK? How much is OK? How much is too much for my child? So how do we form healthy digital habits? And what are the scientific facts? At this very moment, laboratories across the whole world are studying the impact digital tools have on behavior, the brain, and medical health. This is a very young literature. Let me give you a little perspective. It takes about 20 years to establish an effect in science. 20 years. Tablets and the fact that they began to be used by very young children is at most seven year old or eight years old. We are doing it commercially before we have actually done the science. I would much rather we do the science first and then we say, oh, is it safe or not? That alarm was first sounded by psychologists, psychiatrists and paediatricians after in-the-field work with children. We head to Rony-sous-Bois, just outside Paris. Iman, a young mother, and her daughter Malia are in to see Dr. Dieu Osika for the second time. Malia, your turn. Where's my princess? Hello, Malia. Hello, ma'am. Have a seat. We'll talk this over again a bit. How is our little Malia coming along? How old is she now? Two years and four months. I was a bit worried because Malia didn't talk much. She had sudden mood changes, too. In 20 years as a pediatrician, Dr. Dior Osika has witnessed the sharp rise in screens in tiny children's lives and the mounting problems. All these children have interactional disorders. I have more of them than ever before. Temperament disorders, too. Clearly, difficult children have always existed, but there is a sharp rise of those with no concept of limits, who balk at frustrations, who have fits of anger, language problems, poor language skills, unstructured language, or even none at all. Voilà, tu as beaucoup changé, Malia. Je suis très contente. Tu es sage, tu parles de mieux en mieux. Barely six months ago, Malia was spending up to six hours a day watching screens. Morning cartoon shows, meals in front of the TV, YouTube videos on the mobile phone after naps. Taking the pediatrician's advice, the mother stopped all of that. 
There's interaction now, whereas before she'd often be on the... You just said a highly important word, interaction. It is key here, because the screens had taken the place of interactions that needed to take place between you two. Between dad and her, and between you and her. That's it. So clearly this altered things. It did. Screens are a major issue in public health today. We absolutely must be aware of this. The pediatrician's waiting room has all the usual prevention campaign posters, but also messages to raise awareness of the dangers of screens. Schools are also now wary of screens. Primary school teachers must cope with an increase in mood and language disorders. Today, many professionals in the field of early childcare suspect screens of being a cause of many of these disorders. Numerous epidemiological studies conducted worldwide justify the rising concern. For a number of years, people have tracked exposure to screens um, in young children. And what they've found is that, on average, if there are higher amounts of screen exposure, this can be associated with some negative outcomes. A disruption to sleep, disruption to attention, disruption to weight, and disruption to learning. Scientists consider that for toddlers aged three and under, exposure is excessive when it exceeds two to three hours per day. The problem is that the digital offer is sparking growing consumption and at earlier ages than ever. In the 1970s, most children didn't start watching TV before the age of four. Today, screens enter their lives at just four months old. For one third of toddlers under age two, exposure currently exceeds 90 minutes per day. It then climbs to three hours per day, even six in the USA. In our digital era, many children spend over a third of their waking hours absorbing video content. What are the results of this? Rather surprisingly, it is difficult for scientists to answer that question. The phenomenon is more complex than it appears, and experiments that must be carried out to analyze it are sometimes rather odd. Dr. Dimitri Christakis heads the Center for Child Health Behavior and Brain Development at Seattle Children's Research Institute. He is a pioneer in research on small screens. We followed thousands of children uh, from birth to age seven. And what we found was that the more television children watched before the age of three, the more likely they were to have attentional problems later in life, at school age. He and his team think these programs pace is what causes problems in children's brains. So the hypothesis that we had was that prolonged exposure to that rapidly sequenced media would precondition the mind to expect high levels of input and this would lead to inattention later in life. Stated otherwise, a young brain regularly exposed to high levels of pictures and sounds would in the long term have problems concentrating on tasks that require time such as reading and writing. But does this sensorial bombardment set off actual observed problems in children being studied? Because epidemiological studies are always subject to the criticism that they can't prove a causal relationship. The next logical step normally would be to conduct an experiment, what we call a randomized controlled trial. In this case, that would mean taking infants, exposing half of them to fast-paced programming, the other half to none and following them as we did in our epidemiological studies for seven years. There would be no ethical or practical way to do that. And so, in a sense, uh, we were at an impasse. The only workaround? Conduct the experiment anyway, but on young mice. So what we really kind of created was sort of TV for mice, where we had the sounds coordinate with these lights to kind of put on a show, if you will, for the animals. The programs here start the same time every day. You're too slow! We have 
lots of different cartoons that we layer on top of each other, and then we change uh, the frequency of the cartoon so that the mice can hear it. We have a lot of lights that surround the cages, and we have them flash, and the flashes coincide with the sounds that we play. And how about this? Ninja Joe at night. We do that for six hours per day, and the mice um, that we're giving the stimulation to, it starts at 10 days after birth, and it goes for 40 days. Dozens of young mice have undergone the treatment. Their behavior is studied from every possible angle and compared to unexposed mice. The result? The mice raised six hours a day in front of this mock TV do not behave normally. What we find with a normal mouse is that they'll stay around the perimeter here. They like to explore, but they want to stay safe. When we take those mice that underwent the sensory stimulation, they have a much different pattern of behavior. So they'll run around the maze like crazy, and then they spend a lot of time going into the center of the maze, which we would consider to be much more risky. And so the way that we interpret that kind of behavior is that the mice are impulsive. Heightened impulsiveness, but also cognitive problems. Tests reveal learning difficulties, lower memory capacity, a handful of clues that hint at concentration problems. What we see in humans in observational studies is that exposure to rapid paced programming early in life decreases attention and increases impulsivity. And we find the same thing to be true in a mouse model. That's the current state of evidence in 2019. Cell phones and tablets now clutter our daily existence. They wriggle their way into our relationships, even the most fundamental ones. Today, screens are suspected of harming parent-child relationships. In the beginning, the debate centered on TVs being left on, constantly running in the background and TV shows unsuitable for tiny viewers. This disrupts parent-child interactions. In today's world, the issue is how greatly cell phone usage disrupts family relationships. Just how much does this device, which we constantly keep by our side and which steals our attention, disrupt our interactions with loved ones? To answer this question, the Child and Infant Lab is currently monitoring 115 families in and around Linköping, Sweden. The aim is to gather precise data on families' digital habits and their impact on cognitive development. Studies on hundreds of infants demonstrate that the earlier cell phone screens make their ways into babies' lives, the later they begin to speak. Even parents' constant use of cell phones may hinder children's language development. However, as these studies are based solely on parents' self-reporting, the data are not entirely reliable. For the first time, Linköping University will collect precise data on babies' digital environments by placing spy microphones into babies' clothes. Analyzing these recordings shows what is actually happening. This access to the sounds in the home lets us count the number of words pronounced by adults and by infants, the number of interactions occurring per day. We can also identify sounds emitted by digital devices. With this method, researchers can detect whether families' digital habits are influencing their interactions with their babies and can evaluate the consequences on their later language development. When infants hear very few spoken words, their language learning is different, as our research demonstrates. Similarly, parents who are absorbed with electronic devices tend to spend less time talking to their babies. Therefore, digital habits do have consequences. But the study on growing up in the digital world has only just begun. To confirm that the omnipresence of screens affects language acquisition, even cognitive development, we must wait until all these children under study have reached talking age. Well, this, Ninja Joe Ignite, with long sword of shining steel.
programs that disrupt attention spans, screens suspected of harming parent-child relationships, of hindering language learning. Irrefutable proof is still lacking to condemn digital devices definitively, but scientists have found another key factor. The brains of children under the age of two cannot analyze what is happening on a screen. One thing that we really need to consider is that it's very hard for children to navigate between the 2D and the 3D world. Um, it is hard for them to transfer information and to understand that things that are on the screen are the same out in the real world. Infants' difficulty with screens was revealed in experiments conducted by Dr. Georgine Trosseth, a psychology professor at Vanderbilt University in Tennessee. Here is one of her experiments on a toddler under age two. Professor Trosseth hides a stuffed toy in a room as the child watches her do this on a monitor. The child is told to go find it in the room, which he has never seen before in real life. Will he locate the toy as easily as if he had not watched the scene on the monitor? Where do you think he is? The answer is no. It's very difficult for them to learn. It's more difficult than a face-to-face -face interaction. And this difficulty we've found is about 50% less learning from a screen than from a live interaction. And this difference has been called the transfer deficit. Before age two, nothing viewed on a screen can be directly transposed to real life. To find the neurological source of this difficulty, Professor Rachel Barr's team is now investigating using cutting-edge technology. Her goal, film the brain right in the middle of a deficit transfer. In this experiment, Clara, age four, must learn via a video chat how to position a toy robot's articulated arms and legs. Can I show you this one, Clara? All right, let's see. Look at that. Can you show me what I showed you on yours? Okay, I'm gonna do the same thing with you. Wow. This? Can you hold it up a little bit? When the demonstration is run using a screen, just like with a stuffed toy experiment, most often the children fail. But this time, brain activity is being measured during the exam. Apparently, exchange via a screen does not stimulate the brain's learning center the same way that face-to-face -face interaction does. There is more activation in the frontal parietal cortex when a baby is learning from a live interaction than when they are copying from a video chat. And we think that that's, it's only preliminary, uh, but we think it's really exciting um, because it suggests that what the information that you're processing uh, differs and this could partially account for this transfer deficit, this difficulty in picking up information. Why do brains treat virtual action differently from real action? This remains a mystery. One. However, scientists have found a way to palliate this difficulty. When a parent accompanies a child and takes pains to put words to the action on the screen, the learning hurdle diminishes, but only somewhat. Where's the car? Where's the car on the TV? Can you point to the car on the TV? Right there. No, but come point on the TV. Come up on it and touch on the TV. Right here. Oh, there it is. On-screen action remains less stimulating for young brains than real-life action. Therefore, any time that little ones spend in front of screens is essentially wasted time for them. A child under three has little waking time, so this time ought to be used for developing cognitive and social skills. They are key for toddlers. 
Let's avoid screens altogether for children under three, just as we avoid putting steak in baby bottles. Clearly, a baby's stomach cannot digest solids. Its brain cannot digest screens. No screens before age two or three. That's the official recommendation of most scientific and medical academies worldwide. Up to age five or six, they advise a limit of one hour per day, preferably accompanying the child. Mealtimes and bedtimes should be screen free. What about later though? At age six, 10, 15, with age, the digital landscape becomes more complex. In addition to cartoon shows, there are video games, cell phones, social networks. So what precautions are needed for big kids? We're in a residential area of Tulsa, Oklahoma, the McCormack's home. Dinner's ready. Here, as in most American homes, life centers around the TV. No meals at the table. Even homework is done in front of the TV. Miranda, the mother, makes the meals and spends the rest of her time policing their screen usage. Thank you. Thank you, Mama. You're welcome, Charlie. There's enough room for everybody. Yeah, but this is the best view. That's the best spot? We have Charlie's channel. Yeah, is there honey in it? Is this, no, there's not. Is this what you're watching? We're not changing the channel while, while we're eating. Okay. Screen time rules and limits are no big deal with Trevor and Anthony. They know the rules and they pretty well stick to the rules and they're grateful that they get to have screen time. With the little ones, um, Screen time is definitely a topic of arguments. Danny, age eight, and Charlie, age six, have grown up with consoles and cell phones. Getting up off the couch is always negotiated with video game time. Can I play the Xbox? <laughs> Only for an hour. Okay, so it's 5.12. At 6.12, your time is up. Okay? 6.12? Mm-hmm. My, can um, I still like start the game before the time starts? No. Just I'll have to wait for this to load, wait for it to load more, and then okay. But time starts, okay. <laughs> That's part of playing the game. I'm sorry. It's fine. You'll be fine. In the USA, kids under 12 spend an average 4 hours and 40 minutes per day with screens. Past age 13, the daily average climbs to 6 hours and 40 minutes. Watching videos remains the main activity. But we must also add time spent on social network video games, surfing the internet. In one school year, a teenager spends more time in front of the TV and cell phone than in front of teachers. This craze for screens ranges from Fortnite to YouTube, Instagram, TikTok, Twitch, Snapchat, Netflix, WhatsApp, Amazon, Tinder, Twitter, Tumblr, Viadio, Meetup, Flickr, Pinterest, Periscope, Mixed Is any of this suitable for adolescents, a critical period of brain development? Is everybody ready to go? Yeah. yeah. We're about to leave. Hey, Trinity, are you ready? This morning, Trinity, age 11, and Trevor, 12, have a special meeting. They've been participating for a year and a half now in the largest study ever conducted on teenage brain development. Are you sitting up front? It's not that bad. Did you not get a blood? Every three months, the siblings go to the Tulsa Brain Research Institute to undergo a battery of tests. Hi. Hi. The ABCD study is um, close to 12,000 uh, children across the country in 21 centers. There is uh, Portland, uh, Los Angeles, San Diego, Salt Lake City, Denver, there is um, St. Louis, and then there's obviously Tulsa, and uh, it's the largest of its kind. 
first stage in the day for Trevor and Trinity is to give a detailed report of their daily digital habits. How much time per day would you say you text on a cell phone, tablet, computer, iPod, or other electronic device? An hour. How much time per day do you uh, visit social media apps such as Snapchat or Facebook, or Twitter, Instagram, or stuff like that? An hour. How often do you play mature rated video games? Like Call of Duty or Grand Theft Auto or Assassin's Creed. I don't play video games. Do you watch or stream movies or TV shows? Such as Hulu, Netflix, or Amazon. Like during summer or holiday? Two hours. Two hours? Two hours, 30 minutes? Awesome. Digital practices are numerous. Our aim is to identify those that might create problems for developing vulnerable young brains. The second decade of life, um, you will see dramatic changes in the brain. Um, what happens is that the brain continues to mature during that period and really uh, transforms from a child brain to an adult brain. The brain develops, the, particularly in the areas that we think about our personality. So, in control, decision making, uh, emotional regulation, all of that happens 